Matthew 5.16, it says, Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine, keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, the generous Father in heaven. We're still singing. We're still singing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm satisfied with just a somebody that you know that's not here, that's a clue that they were uh, playing a little too late last night. You know that? <laughs> Call no, them up and make them feel guilty. I mean, just pour no. it on. Well, visitors, thank you for being here today. I've had the opportunity no. to meet some folks visiting for the first time and uh, some friends from down south. Uh, they're here today and so good to see them as well. So hope you had a great new year. Uh, we know that because you're here and you know you weren't out, you're the spiritual crowd. <laughs> Everybody else is not here. We need to just pray for them a little bit more. So stand up, find somebody, shake their hand, say happy new year. What's for lunch? Uh,
All right, all right. Thank you very much. If you'd grab a seat, please. Man, nothing's happening. Okay, somebody doesn't want to sit down back there. <laughs> we want to welcome those that join us on a regular basis on, on our YouTube, our live streaming. Happy New Year to you folks. Hope you had a great holiday. And uh, thank you for being so faithful with us as well. Uh, and it just kind of... It, it amazes me the people that uh, that watch us and yeah. from all over the place and I I'm starting to get text messages from people that have found my phone number and just thanking us for everything uh, that the band has done and so I just want to give you before David comes up uh, I met with the band this weekend or on Friday and had a great time with them and and uh, you know I love these guys I've, they've been a part of my life many of them for gosh since 2016 and uh, so uh, some of them are living a little scruffy, Dennis. Uh, hey, but hey, uh, hey, hey. anyway, he doesn't care. I resemble that. Remark. Yeah, yeah, we know it. But anyway, uh, it's just funny the journey I've been. Tom was a part of the band, and and so we, you know, he we got them to come after about 340 phone calls that he would not return. Uh, and so then uh, the band and we were looking for somebody to, to you know lead our music and so I kept calling him and calling him and calling him and I got to where I didn't like him uh, because he wouldn't answer his pick and phone so I finally found out where he lived and uh, I showed up at, the, at his doorstep knocked on his door and this little blonde snot nosed girl answered and now she has purple hair I don't know what that's all about uh, so anyway uh, I told her who I was and she said so and I said just like your father uh, so anyway, we connected, and, and you know these guys were a part of us down south, and uh, so thankful that they're with us. And then of course the folks that came on board uh, that live up in this part of the country. But I met with them, and just to let you know, you're going to see some changes. Uh, we're going to start mixing things up on Sunday morning, uh, and so uh, I've just kind of said, guys, do it. And so you're going to see a lot of new looks because uh, we get a little too comfortable sometimes and uh, really focus. So I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, you know, I said, mix it up, start thinking about different ways to get creative. And they didn't tell me they were going to start this morning because uh, they were singing and I thought they were done. And then, you know, Diane had to get spiritual and read scripture. Uh, so uh, anyway, but uh, just want to share that with you because a lot of people don't like change. We'll get used to it. Uh, changes, changes the new normal, and uh, we're going to mix some things up and do some stuff that we really believe is going to help, you know, focus us uh, on uh, Sunday morning and worship and the Word, and uh, we're going to get people involved. So I share this with you that, you know, if God has done something in your life, I, 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 and you'd like to share what God has done, I, I don't want you coming up here talking about the church, okay? A lot of times people talk about the church, and if the churches and the people in the church have been, you know, loved you and you've had fellowship, that's great. But we want to hear what God is doing in your life, okay? Uh, and uh, we'd like to have people share. And so uh, just don't get crazy, no crazy stuff, uh, you know, uh, you know, no... Uh, you know, no talking, you know, how God answered the prayer because the bunny rabbit found a home. Uh, you know, so we don't want any of that stuff. We just want to know what God has done in your life. Because isn't it true that the scripture teaches we're supposed to encourage one another? You know, and, and some of us may be going through a hard time, a dark time. Uh, you know, we've lost a family member. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's... Uh, uh, it's, you know, I got a phone call this week from French's funeral home and they said they were looking for a cowboy uh, pastor to do a service. And I said, well, okay, and send me the information. Well, they sent me the information and the gentleman that passed away is a father of a good friend of mine back in the day and we rodeoed together and I haven't seen him and, and uh, so uh, I haven't seen him in probably four or five, six years and talking to some other folks in the church this morning that know him and uh, so you know they're going through a dark time uh, and I've been through that dark time of losing somebody and so you know my job on Wednesday is I'm going to be encouragement to that family and you may have lost a, a 
family member. And we just need to hear, people need to hear from others about what God has done in those times. It may be a time of uncertainty. It may be a time where you're trying to make a life decision. It, it may be a time of loneliness. Uh, you know, we, we live in a sea of people, but, you know, we're lonely. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and so we want to start just encouraging people. So uh, if you'd like to share something, holler at me and, and uh, we'll get you scheduled to be a part of it. Uh, plus, it's just neat to hear what God's doing in people's lives, isn't it? Uh, and so we'd like to do that. So uh, if, if a lot of if the change takes place and you don't like it, it's the band's fault. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, David, come on up, buddy, and share with us. You know, it's funny about some of these songs. Uh, the last one we sang was I Want a Harp in a, in, a, in a Crown. I have a friend down in uh, Estancia, Carl Bradley, who just wants a field with a combine <laughs> on the new earth. He just wants to drive combines. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, a man, I can't remember who was, just talked to me, is uh, John Flora, is, has uh, leukemia over in Kansas City, pray that God will bless him and help him, he's 70 something, and, and so let's keep that in mind. Also, just a kind of quick reminder, after the reprieve the last two Sundays, we have to tear down and put things away today. Okay, oh, so if you're used to helping us at the end, please stay and help, that would be good. Bible studies are back up and running. Um, the bulletin, of course, uh, shows that, and, and I don't know if you noticed, but we're gonna start an evening service uh, this evening? You know, no, not really. <laughs> uh, how many of you noticed that at the bottom of the bulletin? Yeah, not everybody. I did. <laughs> anyway, let's keep praying for Barbara King and, uh, and her needs. John and Becky, uh, Macaulay, they've struggled, especially John has really, really struggled with uh, <laughs> all kinds of pain and difficulties. Let's keep praying that God will heal him. And Birdie, she had a UTI and then went to the hospital and got sick. So she's not here this morning, so let's keep praying for her. Also, Pat Beatty, cancer-free. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And then uh, Keith and Roni's, Keith's dad passed away. Let's uh, pray for them. Also, preschool this morning is canceled. The uh, furnace doesn't work in the, in the building. It's cold as can be in there, so they had to move the older kids into the preschool area. And Anyway, so preschool, back in the corner, or in your lap, whichever. Okay? All right. So, read your bulletins. It's really important to read your bulletin. Uh, plus, it's good reading. And uh, keep informed about what's going on. So, let's pray. There's just so many people to pray for, but let's, let's kind of remember these folks that we've mentioned. Father, we just pray that you just have your way this morning in each of these folks that are in some great need, some, uh, some very, very serious illnesses. God, we pray that you just help uh, um, John Flora in his uh, battling leuke leukemia. God, I pray that you just help him and, and the chemo stuff and all that junk that just is, makes your body so bad. I pray that, Lord, you just lift him up this morning out there in Kansas City. Bless him. Father, we pray for John and Becky and their needs, and we thank you, Lord, for their spirit and their hunger for you. We pray that you just lift them up. And Barbara as well, Lord, touch her body. And uh, so many others, as Bertie, dear lady, is in our church, and I pray that you just help her as she uh, struggles with getting over this cough and stuff. Lord, all of us, we pray that you just put a guard around our bodies, around our hearts and, and our, our, our mouths even and throats so that uh, these illnesses will just be forbidden from us. Father, we thank you that you are on the throne this morning, that you're preparing a place for us. We look forward, Lord, at least I do, look forward to going to see you and to be with you forever in eternity. And I pray that, Lord, you would just lift up every single person if there's anybody here that's struggling with this spiritual needs in their life, I pray that you'll lift them up and, uh, and give them peace, give them, uh, help them to know forgiveness of their sin. Father, we pray that you just bless. May this day be a very special day, this first day of this year. Oh God, do a work in our hearts. Bless uh, Brother 
Kurt, as he shares with us from your word, Lord, just, uh, we just thank you for what you're going to be doing throughout this year. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I 
could ever dream He says be still and know I'm everywhere And as for tomorrow, I'm already there
God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good. Dismiss the kids, so elementary age kids only. Head on back. Your teachers are back there waiting for you. Well, thank you, thank you, Ben. Amen. There you go. I appreciate that. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us or following us on YouTube for the first time, we have been uh, in a series where we're covering every book in the Bible. And uh, who said that? Uh, there you go, brother. I'll pay you another dollar for each one. Uh, and uh, so we're in the book of Psalms today. Uh, it's the longest book in the Bible. Uh, and uh, it has the longest chapter and the shortest chapter. Chapter 119, 119 is the longest with, I believe, 173, 176 verses. 
chapter 117 is the shortest book in the Bible. It's got two verses. Uh, and so we could spend a lot of time going through that, but we're, I believe it or not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish Psalms today. We're going to get through it all. Uh, so um, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, it's not a promise. There was this preacher, and he had to get new uh, false teeth. And uh, so uh, first Sunday after he got his new false teeth, he, he preached for about two minutes. His mouth was just in so much pain. And so uh, the next week, he, he preached for about five, six minutes. And, and then the third week, man, he preached for an hour and a half. Finally, the people had to jump up and tackle him to get him to shut up. And uh, they asked him, said, what happened? And he said, well, you know, the first couple of weeks, my teeth, my gums are so sore from the false teeth. And he said, obviously, this morning, I got up and put in my wife's false teeth. That's funny, you know it. Don't look at me like that. So, uh, that, I'm just the messenger. I'm just the messenger of that joke. A gentleman in our church sent it to me and wanted me to tell it, and it would not be spiritual for me to mention any names, John McCauley, but we'll just leave it from there. When I was in uh, college, and I'm, there's a family visiting today, and and they live less than an hour, uh, and he drove all night, I guess, to get here, correct? Uh, and uh, that's crazy because they live in Warrensburg, Missouri, and I was just south uh, at Bolivar, Missouri at Southwest Baptist University, and then just east of where they live in Warrensburg. My first church that I served at uh, was First Baptist Church of Windsor as a youth guy during the summer, so uh, he drove all night to get here. And so uh, thank you for being here. If you fall asleep, that's okay. Uh, but uh, your father-in-law, he falls asleep all the time. So could you just nudge him? Uh, he's on the end aisle. You could just knock him out of the chair. Uh, but anyway, when I went to school there, one of the classes I had to take kind of freaked me out. It was called hymnology. And I thought, hymnology? Why in the world do I have to study hymnology? So a guy that was a senior and, and was graduating that year, I said, what's hymnology? Oh, it's just a study of, of hymns and theology. Well, he's a lying dog. Uh, it was a class on, you know, we had to learn how to lead a worship service, and then uh, every student had to lead one, So, uh, including me, uh, which I hated uh, with a passion. And, uh, you know, I, I have no rhythm. And uh, so, you know, we had to pick these songs and then do the bring in the sheep, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, I mean, I, I had absolutely no, it was, it was pitiful, it was terrible. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, but it was a great study on understanding the value of hymns uh, and the importance of hymns. And so today when we get into the book of Psalms, Psalms itself, the, the book means the book of praise. It is the book of praise. And, and it's probably the book in the Bible that most people go to and read the most. Because it covers every aspect of life. It covers pain in life. It covers uncertainty in life. It covers anger toward God. Uh, it covers, you know, fear and being attacked by other people. I mean, every aspect of life is in the book of Psalms. And, and when the Reformation, I'm going to give you a little Christian history here, when the Reformation took place in uh, October 1517, the Catholic Church was primarily the state religion. It was the government religion. Uh, and there was a guy named Martin Luther, which is where Lutheran, you know, the Lutheran religion or denomination came from and he got to reading the book of Romans and in reading the book of Romans he you know he was a monk uh, he became a monk because he was uh, uh, walking down the road one day and lightning hit him and he yelled out to God and said God help me and if, if you help me and save me from this lightning strike I'll become a monk and that's how he became a monk and so Martin Luther, he was a teacher in the Catholic Church. Uh, he was well known and respected as a teacher. But when he began to read the book of Romans, he realized uh, that there were some things that were wrong 
in the Catholic Church. In fact, he called them indulgences. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as he studied the indulgences, he found out that they, there were indulgences that the Catholic Church was dealing with in, in politics, in religion, in finance, and social issues. And so after he began to go through this and begin to study this, he wrote a paper, and it's called the 95 Thesis, and it was 95 issues that he had with the Catholic Church based on reading the book of Romans and said that the church could improve uh, if it did these things and basically came out and said stop being corrupt. And so one of the things that was one of the biggest deals was is that he totally disagreed with the Catholic Church that you had to go to a priest to have your sins pardoned. And so, uh, you know, just a little more history about him. Martin Luther, you know, he had some emotional challenges. I mean, he, you know, he, he probably would be considered as somebody with mental illness uh, based on reading history about him. Uh, and he was always perplexed. He always felt guilty. He always never felt like he could connect with God, even though he was teaching this. So he'd work harder, he'd work harder. And then when he wrote the book, read the book of Romans, ta-da, what he discovered was salvation only came through God's mercy and grace, not through the church. And that totally, totally caused a major issue in the church time. And so his life was totally changed. And so when the Reformation, it finally ended. So it started in 1517. It ended in 1555. Some even go further and said it ended in the 1600s. Uh, but when it finally wrapped up in 1555, the reformers, the people that had jumped on with him, they agreed to two issues. First of all, the Bible should, be, should have to be translated into every language. In other words, there was no copy in German, there was no copy, and so that was it. They wanted to focus on getting a copy of the Old and New Testament in the countries around them and their languages. And the second thing they agreed upon is that the church had to have a hymnal or a psalter is what they called it. But basically it was a hymnal. And that hymnal was based out of what came out of the book of Psalms. Uh, and so automatically the reformers realized the value of music in Psalms and the value of praise and worship and so if you look at kind of the history of, of, of worship over the years and you study it you know it was very you know just very you know no no response we sing the songs it became kind of mundane you did the things you did the rituals and and that's kind of how it was well as different denominations came along you know you had the apostolics you had the pentecostals and they would take a hymn and and you know they they'd tune it up a little bit and they'd start kicking on the ivory and people would bebop down the aisles and do somersaults and and all of a sudden i mean that's that hymn became something we had a lot more life and then if you were in the baptist life or you know some of these other like lutheran and methodist there was not a lot of response and then the baptist really broke loose when they said you could do this you could, you could do this. Remember that those days? You could do this, but if you did this, oh, that was Satan taking control of your soul, you know, because that was wrong. And now you go to Baptist churches and they're all over this. So we've gone from this very stoic type of just sing the song, and it was more out of duty than listening to the words. Then now we've gone to the place that we've got this full-blown charismatic worship jumping. You've seen them on church. They're jumping up and down and all this praise and worship uh, and, and fog machine, machines, which Sarah wants a fog machine. Uh, and uh, so I thought we'd get a disco ball and, you know, we'd, you know but to just kid. Some of you look at me like, really? Uh, and so now they've gone off and all this praise and worship stuff, but the danger about, and I, there's great praise and worship, but the danger about a lot of it's theologically incorrect. Theologically incorrect. And, and do you know one of the biggest things that changed the whole praise and worship was Hillsong? Do you know what Hillsong songs, the majority of them are not theologically correct? All right. And uh, Mom and I just watched this documentary on Hillsong, 
and the downfall, it's two series. It's terrible. It's terrible what went on in that church. It's terrible uh, the things that took place. The, the staff parties and drinking and drugs and the affairs uh, from Brian Houston all the way down, you know, Carl Lentz. Uh, I mean, it, it's unreal. Uh, and they had people that were a part of it uh, sharing their stories and basically, you know, slave labor. Uh, it, it's amazing. And, you know, Carl, uh, Brian Houston's dad was the founder. Uh, and in the 60s, he molested a boy that was the son of a, a close family. And in Australia and New South Wales, it is against the law if you know of a molestation that took place and you do not report it. So Brian Houston, uh, you know, the pastor of Hillsong, he is going to be sentenced in February because he knew about it all along. And they are saying he could go to prison and most likely will have prison time because they covered up that. And it's against the law to hold that in. And he's been doing it for years. So, uh, you know, and you go, really? Folks, I'm going to tell you, don't be surprised. Okay? Don't be surprised because when you stop teaching the Word of God and you begin to amplify it for personal gain and personal benefit to gain millions and millions of dollars, uh, then what happens is, and then when immorality and sin begins to take over, God begins to shut things down. And you're going to see more of it. Don't be surprised in, in the future if you see more of these large churches and these TV pastors, because if you follow them and you study them, they are not teaching the Word of God. They are adding to the Word of God. They are adding to the Word of God to lift themselves up, to promote themselves. And, and so that's the world we live in and a lot of people think oh hill songs great listen you can sit down and take the time and listen to their songs and there's stuff in those songs that are theologically not correct and and there's a lot of that going on and so praise has gone from a very stoic thing to literally out of control emotions it's gone and and god is not in either one and so when our band plays they're not here to entertain us Okay, that's not their purpose. That last song, we like to clap, that's great. You know, that's part of worship. But there's other songs that, that they sang uh, this morning that are just great worship songs. And, and we're not wor used to worship songs through country gospel. You know, that's kind of an archaic thing. It's not what the band does or how well they play it or what notes they hit or miss. It's the words that they sing. Say, and, and so worship is a huge, it's the whole book of Psalms. It's, Psalms is, is broken into five books. It's just not one book. And I'm going to go through what each of those books means and, and what chapters they cover. But at the end, it is a book of worship. And I really believe that biblically, most of us have missed the value and the importance of worship in our lives. I really do. And not to pick on one gender, but I am. Men, we don't do it very well. We just don't. Because I'm a man. I ain't going to worship. I ain't going to worship. That's just, that's woman stuff. Seriously, I've heard that. I've heard that. You know, women, women are emotional. They, do, they go by feelings. We, we're not going to do that. It makes me look like I'm weak. No, we become weak when we don't worship, guys. We become weak when we don't worship. When you go through the scripture, what did Joshua do before Jericho? He went out and he worshipped. What did David do before battles? He worshipped. What did Daniel do? He worshipped. What did the three in the fire did? They worshipped. Worship is where our strength comes from. You know, and when we have our time of, of, of a quiet time, you know, quiet time involves reading the word of God, prayer, and worship. You see, man, I got to sing. No, you don't have to sing. But worship is where we get strength. You know where we get strength? Because when we worship, the word worship means worthy ship. He is worthy. When we worship, we invite God into our lives and our world. Right? Now think about that. When we worship, we are inviting him into our lives. And in all my years doing this, my first church was when I was 19, so I added up to where I am now. 
and uh, don't remind me. Um, but in all of my years, if I took the time, I could quantify very easily, if I took the time, at every church that I served and staff at, or every, you know, parachurch ministry I've served at, that there has been more time in churches and ministries caught up in drama and gossip and politics than there has been worship. I mean, I, I'd stake my life on that. You say, maybe if we as a church would worship more, we would have less of that other stuff. Maybe if we worship more in our own lives, we would have less of that drama. Because why? We've invited God into our lives. We've invited him into our world. All right? Maybe if we came to church and, 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 and worshipped and not felt like we were being entertained, because I can tell you, talking with this band on a Friday night, uh, they are very passionate about what they do. And, and they are very passionate that the songs they sing have a message of the gospel. Now, I know some of you sitting out there and going, well, Please explain to me how the song When Willie Gave Up Weed had anything to do with the gospel. Well, you know what? Every now and then we have a little fun. And that's okay. You know? Every now and then we have a little fun, and, and that's okay. You know? Uh, and, and it's okay to take a song like a George Strait song that, that I love that song, What Goes Up Must Come Down. You know? And that's a story about, you know, Jesus going to heaven and coming back. You know? Uh, it's a great song. And it's a great song to worship to. But you know what happens? People automatically hear a George Strait song and they think, dance. No, it's a great song. We, because of the name, we don't listen to the words. All right? And so when we get into this whole concept of looking at the book of Psalms and, and we begin to understand what it's all about, Psalms in Hebrew is the word mizmor. And it's a book of praise. This is what the Hebrew word, it's a book of praise that brings forth a bright song or music with melody. That's what the word means. It's a book, Psalms means that. In the Greek, it's psalmos, and it means play a stringed instrument. Because is it not true that when you listen to music, it can kind of, uh, it, it can kind of get this type of emotion and response from you? You know, some of you can be driving down the road and not having a great day, and all of a sudden one of your songs comes on, and the next thing you know, man, you're bebopping, and the truck or car is swerving from side to side, and you're, you're just having a great time, and you're clapping. I mean, you're having a great time. You know, my kids, I, I love my kids, my girls, they buy me Christmas gifts that in, in, in all of my life I would never think about getting that. But then when I get it, I'm like, how did I live without it? You know, so my youngest daughter, you know, she's uh, big into this essential oil thing. And I was like, you yeah, know, okay, whatever, darling, you know, it's your thing, float your own boat, you know. So she sent me this thing that's kind of a mister, uh, and, you, and with frankincense. And so I have it going at night, and I'm telling you what, folks, you can say what you want to say, but I understand now why frankincense was one of the gifts. I sleep better. I don't have breathing problems at night. I wake up feeling better. Uh, I mean, I've rubbed it on like sore muscles and it goes away. Let me tell you, it's crazy stuff, all right? And I'm usually not into that fad, okay? But, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, it's good stuff. Then my other daughter, she sent me, uh, you know, earbuds. And I've had them before, but I just, you know, they weren't good enough and I'm too cheap to buy the good ones. Well, she wasn't too cheap and she bought the good ones. All right. They're in my ears all the time. I mean, I even forget. I walked in the store the other day at Racks, and and you know people were talking, and I had music going on, and and I, you know, and they're kind of big, you know. And I thought, well, at least they'd see it. And they were saying, that, and I was ignoring everybody because I couldn't hear anything because I was listening. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, I I wear them when I'm driving. I I wear them when you know I'm, you know, I, I, you know. I'm, yesterday I was out working. I had them on. I get on my horses. I have them on, uh, and you know. And I'm just listening to music. And what happens is music can cause a response to you. You know, you can have an attitude of an upbeat song, and man, it's yay God, and then another song that slows down, and you're like, I need to contemplate that. I need to think through that. 
So one of the things that we've got to be understand is that is that worship is a part of our relationship with God. It's a part of our journey with God. So the whole theme of the book of, of Psalms reflects man reaching to God for help and God's hand extended to rescue man uh, from his troubles in and through worship. Now, I hope some of you can, can, can share with this, but I don't know about you. There's times that I, I face issues and I'm like, I don't see any way out of this issue. Man, and this issue scares me. I, I, I don't see how I'm going to fix this issue. I don't see what I'm going to do. And all I know to do is what, you know, what Paul says in Romans 8, 26, when he says, when you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit goes before you to God and prays and speaks for you, you know. And all I know to do is just say, God, I don't know what to do on this one. And, and what I've learned over the years is that when that happens, I just say, Holy Spirit, you got to go talk to God because I'm jacked up and I don't even know what to say. And then I just pump in a little praise music. And it's amazing how it just kind of slips away. It, it really does, folks. I'm it just slips away. And I, and I don't notice it slipping away right away. And then later I'm like, oh, yeah, what happened to that? Because it's how God has wired us. And he spends the largest book in the Bible is focused on us praying. See, worship is fundamental to knowing God, to growing, to changing, and to communicating to God. It's fundamental. And if we miss out on worship, we miss out on God's Spirit in, in our lives. So when you look at Scripture, and, and, and we, we learn this from Scripture, when we go into battle, we worship, the Scripture says. When we fear, we worship. When we face uncertainties in life, we worship. When we're betrayed, we worship. When we are broken, we worship. When we're without, when we're without, we worship. When we're insecure, we worship. And when we suffer loss, we worship. And you know why? Because when we worship, who do we worship? We focus on God, and guess what we don't do? We don't focus on our hurt. We don't focus on our problem. We're focusing on God. And when we focus on God in our life and in our world, God brings the peace. But you know what, folks? It takes discipline. You know, we had in, when Reed was with us as you know, an elder and decided to leave because hunting was more important. Uh, and uh, did you hear me, Reed? I'll, I'll repeat that if you didn't hear me. I got no response from him. Uh, and that's not true but he made a comment and I'll never forget it he said maturing in the Lord is hard work you got to focus on it you got to plan for it you got to do your due diligence it just doesn't happen by reading the scripture and listening to a song and oh I feel so much better you know, it doesn't happen, but just, we got to focus on what the scripture says and go, okay, how does that apply to my life? It's just like the songs our band sings, you know, when they sing songs and we're singing it, there's truth in there. I can tell you, outside of some of the goofy stuff we do, these guys work really hard to find stuff that is biblically and theologically correct so that it's just not about coming and, and you know, hearing me teach. They're teaching when they sing and they play. And we just get caught up because music, that's just what you do. No, worship is acknowledging what's being said, which is what they did all through the book of it. So when you look at Hebrews 12, 28, it says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Now, fear means respect. Awe means reverence. And so the book of Psalms is, is a prayer book. It's a worship book, uh, and probably if you looked at the book you go to the most, uh, you run to Psalms. Uh, and I, I was listening to a guy this week, and you know he's been in ministry a lot longer than I have, and he said, I can guarantee you that my entire life in his ministry, there hasn't been a day in my life that I have not gone to Psalms. Because in Psalms, it meets our real needs. 365 times in the book of Psalms, the word fear, fear not, has been used. 365 times, fear not. Hmm, was that coincidence? 
Because what we fear is fear. That's one of the biggest things we have. We fear we're not going to meet up, stand up. We fear we're not going to do this. We fear this. We fear we're not good enough. We fear we're not adequate enough. We fear insecurity. We fear what other people say. You know, we fear this, this. Can I just give you a little, a little uh, a freebie? And some of you may have learned. But when you and I stop being concerned about what other people think about us, your life will be free. Quit trying to please people. It is a trick of Satan as far as I'm concerned, and you will never be at peace. Because I can say something up here and somebody goes, amen, and somebody else is ticked. You know? And they may be ticked because it was the truth. You know, when you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loudest got hit the hardest. You know? And so you can't please people. You know? And, and stop getting your feelings hurt. All right? Well, how do you stop getting your feelings hurt? When God is your focus and not other people. You know? I mean, you just, you just learn. Or learning, somebody asked me the other day, do you seriously not get your feelings hurt? And I said, not really. Sometimes. Well, how do you do that? Because I don't care. You say, well, that's me. No, no, no. I get my feelings hurt if, you know, in certain, if my kid said something to me, oh, it'd, it'd tear me up, you know, you know, because they're my kids. You know, my mom hurts my feelings every day, uh, and so I just I just live with her because she's grouchy. Uh, yeah, it's the other way around. But how do you learn not to get your feelings hurt when you understand who you are in Christ? When you understand who you are in Christ, then your value is on His opinion, not other people's opinion. But how do you get to that place? Well, you gotta make it deliberate. You've got, to be, you've got to be potential. You've got to be diligent to do that. So when we, we go through and we break down the book of Psalms, let me give you some things about Psalms. First of all, do you know there's 77 authors? Not seven, seven authors. David had 75 Psalms. Another guy named Asaph, who was a, was a leader of worship, you'll see that at the top of Psalms. Asaph, he was David's, you know, lead choir guy he wrote 12 the sons of Korah wrote 11 Herman which was a Heman which was a son of Korah he had one Solomon had two you ready for this Moses wrote one of the Psalms Psalms 90 Moses wrote so the book of Psalms was written over a period of a thousand years Ethan and Ezra wrote one and 48 of them are anonymous you get that a thousand years it took to compile a book about what? Worship. <coughs> Psalms means the book of praise. It means worship. Psalms poetry, the, the poetry of Psalms is not like r rhyming. It's not like the, the type of rhyming we do. You know, a lot of songs today rhyme. I remember from first grade. Isn't it crazy how you can remember something that far back? For some of you, I know you can't. Uh, because, you know, you're like 100 years old. Uh, this week I, I, I met a patient, uh, and he was 100 years old, and I walked out of there, and I don't get intimidated. I walked out of there intimidated because he was mentally sharper than me. <laughs> and he looked like he was like 60. Couldn't believe it. The guy was just crazy, a lawyer, and, you know, all that. It was crazy, his, his story. Uh, but I remember first grade that in, in our language arts, remember we had language, not English, we had language arts, uh, we were doing spelling, and they taught us how to spell arithmetic, okay? And it was through a poem, okay? You know what the poem was? A rat in the house might eat the ice cream. <laughs> a rat, huh? You too, okay? Now some of you will go home and write down arithmetic and you'll go back and go, uh, and you'll come back next Sunday and say, you missed one, all right? To which I would say, save your energy because I don't care, all right? But the point is, it, there's a poem, a poem. The book of Psalms is a book of poetry, but it is in thought, not in word. So this will help you understand how to read the book. All right, and so we'll we'll go through what it means is it's a book. So, uh, Psalms does not have a rhythm. It doesn't have a cadence like a lot of songs. It's in thought. So here's how it works. You have the first verse and then the second verse. 
if the second verse complements the first verse. That's how Psalms is written. Or if the second verse doesn't complement or contradicts the first. So it's in thought. So you don't read the book of Psalms and have this cave and say, you're going. It is in thought process. So it either agrees with the first verse or the verse above it, and, and it supports it, or it shows a contrast to it. And any time that you read uh, the word selah, okay, if you read at the end, if you ever wonder what that word is, selah, you know what selah means in Hebrew? Stop. That's what it means, to stop. And the, the, the description is to stop and reflect back on what you read. That, that is a thought that God put and he wants you to go back through it. There's something in there that you need to apply to your life. And so anytime you have Selah, you stop and you go back, you look at what you've read, you meditate because meditate is, is uh, you know, what we do. You know, and, and also you think meditative new age, you know, meditating is just like how cows eat, you know, cows have two stomachs and you know, you know that they chew it up and they chew it up and they drop it and then they regurgitate it and they chew it some more. All right. And that's what we're supposed to do. We are to regurgitate the word of God. We are to read it and then bring it back up and think on it, to meditate on it more, to find the application in our life and then go on. And sometimes we just, is it not true that we just get into reading the Bible and we just want to read it as quickly as we can because we feel like we're being spiritual? Oh man, it's, it's I got to read the Bible before the day's over. Blah, 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 okay? And we don't know anything it said. But boy, we feel good because we're spiritual. We read the Word of God. Well, what did it say? Did you learn? Did you grow? Did you change? Did you forgive? Did you ask? You know, the scripture says in Psalms that God says, Come to me boldly. So if you're ticked off at God, if you're angry at God, if you're mad at God, you think something's unfair at God, God inv invited us. Come to me boldly. Well, I couldn't do that. That would be disrespectful. Well, the problem with being disrespectful is this. Psalm says that God knows every word that comes off our lips before we speak them. Uh, some of you need to think about that one. God knows what's coming before you even speak it so he says come to me boldly well I can't disrespect God let me tell you folks if that was true I should be in hell because when my dad passed away and you know I went some situations when you know my ex-wife was beaten by two guys and pulled out of her car and PTSD took over and we moved to Texas to get her help uh, man I was so angry at God because my dad his death was a long, slow thing that was still unfair. And I'll never understand it till I get to heaven, you know. But I was so mad at both of those situations. I stood out in the field, you know, in one of the pastures. And, I mean, I said things to God that if, I, if I'm guilty about anything, it's guilty about that. Because, I mean, I let him have every foul word there was. I shared it with him. And you know what? Lightning didn't strike. And here I am today. You know, God knows our pain. God knows our hurt. You're not hiding anything from God. You're not hiding a thing from God. So why do we pretend? Well, I won't say anything to God about it because he'll find out. Really? If you truly believe in the God of the Bible, he knew if he's omnipresent, omnipotence, whatever that word is, help me out there, <laughs> tongue tied there, uh, he knows you're going to do it before you were born. So why do we hide those things? He knows our behavior, our attitude, our actions, our choices. But guess what? He doesn't kick us to the curb because he knows we're going to do it. And because we have the word of God to read and say we shouldn't do it, but we do it anyway. You see, that, that's who he is. And so he wants us to go back. He wants us to read it again. And he wants us to look at the depth of it and understand the promise that God has given. Now, some of you have heard this, but you know, for every don't, the scripture says, there's a promise. Every time God says, don't do this, there's a promise that he will fulfill in our lives. But what happens is, is that we don't take the time to do it. So there's 150 chapters. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It's chapter 119 which has 176, chapter 17 has two verses. The five books were written over a period of 1,000 years. I shared this. Each book 
ready for this? Each book, and I'll get those, reflects the first five books of the Bible. So here are the books. Book one is chapters one through 41. And that, those chapters focus on how God is beside us all the time. And we're going to go back to Psalms 1 in a little bit, and uh, we'll walk through that real quick. All right, so, book 2 is chapters 40, uh, uh, 42 to 72, and it is how God goes before us. Now, Psalms 51, you know what Psalms 51 is? It's David's confession of his deal with Bathsheba, killing her husband, and lying. That's his confession. Do you know that he did not confess those events until a year later? So for one year, David carried the guilt of his affair. He carried the guilt of killing her husband. He carried the guilt of lying. And it wasn't until the prophet Nathan came to him a year later and said, Hey, David, I got a story to tell you. There was this guy that had a sheep, and it was like a little one sheep, and it was like a family member. And there was a rich king, and he had some royalty come in, and he wanted to throw a feast, but he didn't want to kill his sheep. So he said, well, that guy's poor, and they only have one sheep, so that doesn't mean anything. So he said, go get that sheep, and he killed that sheep, and they used that sheep to celebrate. And David said, go get that guy, I'm going to kill him. And Nathan looked at him and said, David, you're that guy. That's when David confessed, a year later. Do you think David had a year of peace and joy? (laughs) I guarantee you, folks, David was a sorry, no good guy for a year. I guarantee you he was mean. I guarantee you he was angry. I guarantee you he kept himself, you know, uh, away from people. Uh, I guarantee you that when people criticized him for any reason, he attacked. Why do I guarantee you that? Because we do it. Is that not true? This means yes, class. This means no. Some of you need Jesus. You're lying. Isn't it true that when we try to hide something and not confess something, we're miserable? Why do we do that? God knows. And he's just sitting there waiting to say, it's okay. Confess it and we'll move on. I'll rebuild your life. But David, the man after God's own heart, waited a year. Hmm? Adam did it. He hid too. You, would you want to come teach? Uh, <laughs> just kidding. No, I'm not. Uh, so Psalms 33 is, I mean, Psalms book 3 is chapter 73 through uh, chapters 89. It's how God is all around us. Read Psalm 78. Here's what Psalm 78 tells us. God has been working all along and he's still working. All right. Do you know that in, in Jesus quoted Psalms more than any other Old Testament book? He quoted it 11 times. Do you know in the book of Psalms we are given details about the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus? It covers it all. It covers theology even though it's a book about Psalms. So chapters uh, 90 is book 4. Chapter, uh, book 4 is chapters 90 through 106. It's how God is above us. That's the psalm. Psalm 90 is the one that Moses wrote. And you know what Psalm 90 says? It says, uh, our days are numbered. Our days are numbered. And so Psalm 90, but Moses says, your days are numbered, so make them useful. I love the thing I saw on Facebook yesterday. A little meme came up and said, uh, at your next birthday, just don't think that living another year at 75 is living life basically go live a different year have different goals try new things our time is limited you know the futility of life a guy named thomas carlisle who was just an american writer and poet once said in one of his writings i knew a man born a man but he died a grocer and he wasn't attacking the man's career 
But as you go on and read this little article that he wrote, basically he's saying there's a man that he was born a man, but he died a grocer. He had no purpose. He had no existence. He just played the game of life. He stuck with routine. He did it over and over. And then he, he at the end of his days, he said, what is my life meant? You want to have a life that has meaning? Chase God. Chase God. But be ready. Because I guarantee you, he'll put you in, in something that you're not equipped to do. But he'll equip you. That's what he does. And so chapters in book 5, chapters 107 through 150, uh, is how God is among us. If you read Psalms 128, it's about fearing God, it's respect. And do you know that at the end of each of these books, not chapters, each of these books is a doxology, and I'll show you one. So how do these books line up with the first five books of the Bible? Well, book one, all right, book one connects those first chapters there, uh, chapters 1 through 41, line up and have the theme of Genesis. Book two has the theme of Exodus, all right, because what does book two said? Book two says how God goes before us. What did God do in the book of Exodus? He went before them. The Red Sea, the wilderness, he went before him. There's a theme. Leviticus is book three. What's Leviticus talk about? It talks about how God is all around us. Go through it in Leviticus and you'll see that. Book four is Numbers and book five is, is Deuteronomy. So look at Psalms 150 and this is a doxology that is in and there'll be a doxology at the end of these individual books and there'll either be an amen or an amen, amen. Amen. If there's two amens, that's charismatic. It's biblical. <clears throat> Some of you stayed up too late. <laughs> Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in the mighty heaven. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise His unequal greatness. Praise Him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and the harp. There's the music. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Stop it, Larry. All right? You bring out a tambourine, and I'm bringing a gun. Uh, praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praise to the Lord. Amen, amen. If we did that in church... Some of you would leave and go find a quieter church. And you would find a church that doesn't worship. You see, there is a God-ordained purpose in worshiping. And it doesn't mean you have to do it at church. So let's get that separated. Okay? You can praise anywhere you want. Because... You know what the value of collective praise is? The value of collective praise when we gather is the result of individual praise. Praise is a huge part of this and understanding it biblically. Now, I'll share a couple things with you. What's the most popular chapter in Psalms? 23rd Psalms. What is the psalm that we read at funerals? The 23rd Psalm. And why do we read it? Yea, though you walk through the valley of death. It has nothing to do with death. It is inappropriate to read this chapter at a funeral. Because it has nothing to do with death. It has everything to do with life. And the way that you understand Psalms 23 is read it like you're a sheep. Now how do you do that? You get on all fours. <laughs> get a little hay in front of you bye and you read it all right that's how you read it let me read it the lord is my shepherd the lord is my shepherd is david saying god is my shepherd what does a good shepherd do provides and protects and leads i have all that i need why would we say that at death we could say, I have all that I needed. 
but I have all that I needed because a good shepherd took care of the sheep. They had fresh grass. They had fresh water. They had a place at night that they could get in of what they called a, a sheep pen, which was built. They were all over Israel. They're still there. They're circles that are probably about 30 to 40 feet in diameter. They're rock walls that are that high. There's an opening. There's no gate. John 10.10. 10. What does it say? Jesus says, I lay down my life for my friends. Jesus is the gate that protects his sheep from the enemy. So when you read this, then it says, he lets me rest in green meadows. He lets me. In other words, he takes me to green meadows. That's where I get my nourishment. That's where I get my rest so we can travel the journey. He leads me beside peaceful streams, fresh water, calm. I don't have to, because let me tell you something, folks. You know why we don't want to talk about sheep? Because they're stupid. They are. You know, they are. Sheep are not smart. Uh, uh, Alan gave me a book, and he gives me all these neat books, and, and it was one, I think it was what, The First Cowboy. Was that the name of the, 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 cha- the book, The First Cowboy? And it's written by this guy. He's, he, he's passed, and he's written all these Western books. And, man, I, I couldn't put the book down. And it really has to be a book that captures my attention. And so it was about this first cowboy and how he grew up and on and on and went on his ventures and his son. And, but it's a true story in context of what really happened in settling the West. And, and the part of the book is, is that when the, the, uh, the, the sheep herders come into the cattle country up in Montana and the range wars... Because sheep pull the roots and everything, and it just destroys it. Cows eat the top, it grows back, sheep kill it. All right? And so there are me- mega range wars. And so, he, he, and so they're afraid. And so when they get by things that they're afraid of, so if they went to a stream that was running and had ripple and all that kind of stuff, they're not going to go there because they, they, they're but peaceful, calm streams. All right? He guides me along the right paths. In other words, he takes me where I'm not in danger. He, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, or yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, do you know that many times that that sheep herder in Israel and other countries that do that, they had to go through treacherous areas where thieves and, and there would be wolves and, and bears that would attack? That's what that means. But he walks me through those and he protects me. It has nothing to do with death. In other words, it has everything to do with keeping them alive. He says, when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. That's what our shepherd does for us. We won't be afraid. For you are close beside me, your rod and your staff. A shepherd would have a staff and he would reach out and touch the the sheep and move them in in different places to get them. And that's what God sometimes does. He takes his rod and says, hey, Wake up, dummy. You're going down the wrong way. Wake up, wake up, sheep. You're going down the wrong way. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Well, what's that mean? It means that when they were out at night, they were in good grace. The enemy was around. People could come rob and steal. It could be, it could be uh, wildlife out there. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. You know that, that when he wrote this, he had two sheepdogs. One name was goodness and the other one was unfailing love. <laughs> Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Where's death in that? That's life. Quit reading that as a death passage and read it as a life passage. And then real quickly, give you an example. Uh, Psalms 1. I love this psalm. I think this psalm, this psalm has stuck with me from, oh, I don't know how long. Listen to it. Now, this is this rhyme, a thought and then a thought that, that, that supports. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with mockers. Verse 1. Look at verse 2. But what happens? This compliments. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating it all night, uh, day and night. You see what happens? You run with the sinners, you're not going to happen. But if you do this, what happens? It supports why that. The whole, the whole book, first six verses is. Verse 3. They are like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fresh fruit. 
Well, fresh fruit, what is that? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, long-suffering. How do we get that? We get it through being by a riverbank. What's the riverbank? It's living water. What does the Scripture say? Jesus is. It's the living water. Bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, see, and they prosper in all they do. Verse 4, but not the wicked. They are worthless. Chafe, they're scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Here's a quick thing, folks, as we close. Don't go get your advice from ungodly people. If you're a believer here today and you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, don't go talk to somebody about life crisis that's not a believer. Their values and their priorities morally may be sound, but it's not biblically sound. If you need to get advice, you need to talk to somebody, talk to believers. Talk to believers you know they're walking the walk. Because if you don't, what happens? We get, we get advice from who? The wicked. That's what the scripture says. If you're not a believer, then you know, you're wicked. You say, well, I know people aren't believers, they aren't wicked. Well, hang around. Compare their advice. When you go to the book of Psalms, understand that it is a book to elevate your walk with God. All right? Understand that there is nothing in your life that you go through, that we go through, that is not covered in the book of Psalms. All right? And the reason many people don't understand the value in the book of Psalms is they look at 150 chapters and go, what? But... Isn't it true that we spend millions of minutes doing stuff that have no value? Come on, you know that's true. We spend millions of minutes. Heck, if we did stuff with purpose, we could change the world. And those minutes that we sit around surfing the web or, you know following stuff that has insignificance to our walk with God. And hey, all of us do it, okay? I'm guilty. I get on the Facebook and get on these reels, you know, they have reels about horses and dogs. And next thing I know, you know, it's two hours later, and I'm like, what did I just do? But they're funny. <laughs> they're hysterical. They're fun to watch. But what did it do? Did it add value to my life? Didn't any value to my life. What could I have done in those two hours? What could we have done in that time? So here's what 2023 is going to be for our church, okay? And you're going to hear a lot of it, so get used to it. This is going to be the year of growing faith. Growing faith. And everything we say from up here and everything that comes out of them is going to be about growing faith. Not the year of faith, but the year of growing faith. So I'm challenging all of us to sit down, put down the phone, turn off the TV, and ask yourself, if you're a believer, where do I need to grow in faith? Because it takes time. It takes discipline. Not how much weight you want to lose this year, because we know that never happens, you know. It's good for one day, January 1st, all right? But what do you want to become? What do I want to become spiritually in my faith? Can you look back on 2022 and tag it and go, that happened? If you can, thank you, Jesus. If you can't, then we need to get intentional about our faith. We need to get intentional and say, God, where do I need to grow in my faith? And make that something that you pray toward every day. And I promise you, folks, based on the truth of the Word of God, it'll happen. It'll happen. And God will bless your life. God will renew your life and you will find a purpose in 2023 that you may have been looking for for a long time. 
but it's through our faith. And how do we grow in our faith? Through the word, through prayer, and through worship. Can we accept that challenge? Amen, church. All right, I'm going to hold you to it. Hold you to it. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you carried us through a crazy year. 2023 may be crazier. But God, you're a God of strength and purpose. You say you go before us and fight the battles. So, Father, I pray for everybody here today, if they know you, that God, they would say, God, take my battles and fight them. Grow my faith. Change me. Father, show me the path you want me to go by faith. And if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, knowing Jesus involves some commitment. First commitment is, is admitting that you've sinned, you've missed the mark, you, you haven't stood up to God's plan and promise. That's why Jesus went to the cross, so that we could confess our sins, we agree, and that once we confess it, we repent, means we turn, and we all repent, we all turn, we're all going to fail because we're human, but we confess, we repent, and we ask Jesus into our lives. You may not understand all that, it may be sketchy, heck, I grew up in church, folks, and I didn't understand it at 18 when I accepted Christ, and I still don't understand the greatness of His grace, but I can tell you that I have seen it in my life and I sure couldn't have done it on my own so if you've not ever accepted Christ into your life then what a great way to start out a new year you can pray that prayer just it's a conversation with God it's just not about faith but it's action it's action to change and then be disciplined to grow that's why we're here we're not here for warm fuzzies or a social club our goal is to grow in Christ and help people come to know Christ in a personal way. So, Father, we pray for those today that may not know you. God, I pray that you continue to speak to them. I pray a blessing on everybody in this house, in this room. God, help this be a great year as we as a church grow in our faith. And that, God, as a result, you would be mighty and lifted up and great things would happen. To honor you, Father God. We love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.